we want to say thank you to the singers who have volunteered to share the good news through song. Let's give them a round of applause. And to thank our musicians for leading us in worship. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Break us, melt us, mold us, fill us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of us in the room, at some point in your journey, you met someone who, when you were finishing high school and embarking on adulthood, they said to you, I am proud of you. You have three options. Option one, get a job. Option two, go to college. Option three, go and start a business. They never gave you option four, sit at home and do nothing. And so no doubt, Naaman would have been one who had these options with him on the journey. He set out like many people in this room with an ambition and a drive and a passion and energy to achieve and to do some things for himself. He went into the army in Aram, and he did not just want to be any soldier. He wanted to be extraordinary as a soldier. He got himself many commendations and many stars and many accolades because he was known as a man who had both physical strength and what we call personal charisma. Those above him in the army of Aram saw how special he was, and as they promoted him, eventually he became commander of the army of Aram. Now, we do know that, that the, those in the military go by rank and accolades and place and and no doubt when he got to the zenith of here, he felt really good about himself. We are told that the king had reliability and confidence in him because he was known as a special commander. The Bible paints him and describes him as a great man who had exalted status. And then the word of God uses a conjunction. But have anybody ever felt like you had the whole package? Everything is moving in the right direction in your life. You are excelling in this. You are doing well in this. You are moving in this. Things are rolling and roaring and people look upon you and when they see you coming, they say, isn't she or isn't he great? And then there is a but. And every human being has a but to them. That yes, you are great 
a great woman or a great man. You are glorious in your achievements. But there is a flaw and a fault somewhere in your life. And if that flaw and fault manifests itself, it takes you away from the destiny that God has for you. Come with me into the text. And when you go into the text, it says that Naaman was expected to have multiple people around him, but he had this condition, the skin condition, which in the early, in the scripture translated, it gets translated as leprosy, but in reality, when you look on the Hebrew text, it could be one of four different skin conditions. What we know is that anyone who had these manifestations on their body was not just treated as having a physical dilemma, but socially and status-wise and in terms of career, Everything got upended. Let me help you with it. Do you remember in the 1980s when AIDS and HIV was popularized in our world? People wouldn't use the same bathroom. They wouldn't eat in the same place. If somebody got hugged by someone who had HIV or AIDS, there was this anxiety that am I going to catch it? The, it we, people became ostracized and dehumanized just based upon a physical characteristic or symptom because the ignorance of most of us or the majority of us had people saying that you can't be around such a person. Now, there are people in the room who were not born in 1980. But I want you to think about somebody who was popular, and all of a sudden, something was discovered. And because of that, but people would run away from you instead of to you. The scripture has this marvelous man, this talented, gifted, tremendous warrior in a place in his life when things should be soaring. But there is a pause. Can I ask you this Sunday morning, what's the but in your life? If it got resolved, what if it got removed? What if it got taken away? What if it got changed? Would make you be able to achieve what God wants you. The story takes a strange twist because instead of it being a dialogue between the king of Aram. Uh, Naaman, instead there is a dialogue between Naaman's wife and a young girl who we don't know her name. She simply says that if my master were to go and see the prophet Elisha, I know he would be cured. Remember now, she is a servant who isn't supposed to even speak, much less say such a daring thing which would require the king of Aram in the midst of a war to cease the war, to get his commander to see Elisha in Israel. They're fighting. Aram and Israel are fighting. And she makes this declaration. There is somebody who can help him. I want to say to somebody this morning that my blessings and your blessings 
are tied to someone else. There is somebody in your life Somebody in your journey, somebody on your path, somebody who God has put you around, who your blessings are tied to, and very often it's not who you think. You would have thought that because he was on top of the heap, it would be somebody in his echelon or in his circle. But that's not the path. For him. This young woman says, I have an idea. I have a solution to the problem of Naaman. I have the source of hope. If he goes and sees Elisha, things will be different. And I want to ask you this morning to think about yourself as Naaman. On the outside, you may have all kinds of people praising you. But on the outside, there are things manifesting itself in your life which you have no control over. And on the inside, your confidence is diminishing because you realize that this outward physical condition has begun to confine you. If you had leprosy, you couldn't get a seat in the sanctuary. Maybe we would put you on live stream. That's why you have, Julia, live stream. You could be somewhere else watching, but not in the presence of everyone else. He would be in a confining circumstance. And the Word of God tells us that confining circumstances can produce good things from us, or they can break us. Anybody ever heard of a man named Adolf Hitler? Between the First World War and the Second World War, he was confined in a jail. And in that jail, he came up with all these ideas and a proposal which caused mayhem on people in the world. People who are confined can either be broken, or you may have heard of a man named John Bunyan who wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress. The journey of a Christian through trials and tribulations towards that place that God wanted them. Oh, you may have heard about the letters from the Birmingham jail by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Confining circumstances bring out the best or the worst in us. I want to suggest to somebody here today that in the midst of your confining circumstance, if you can hear the voice of God and receive what God has for you through the source that God has it, then instead of being broken and bruised and failing, you can triumph. Naaman was told, go to Israel. There's a solution in Israel. And so he packs up with chariots and horses. He has 1,500, let me get it right, 1,000 pounds of silver. Can anybody imagine 1,000 Pounds of silver, a hundred and fifty pounds of gold. He has ten suits of clothing. He has enough with him that could buy 
by the neighborhood multiple times. And he gets to Israel and finds his way to Elisha's house. And what do you think happened? Elisha doesn't come and meet him. Elisha does not roll out the red carpet. Elisha does not give him the respect and the recognition which he thinks he is due. Guess what Elisha does? Sends him a messenger. Can I ask this morning, how many of us would be honestly very upset? Did you travel all this journey and the best you can get is a message. Elijah does not regard his money as meaning anything. Doesn't regard his status as meaning anything. Doesn't regard his strength as meaning anything. Elisha as the prophet of the living God is looking to see whether Naaman can submit. It's one of the hardest things for any human being and for all of us who are seeking God to do great things in our lives. Can I submit? Not to my turn but God's terms. Submission means being able to say, God, I'm going to obey what you want even if I don't understand it. Naaman, we are told, was so angry, he was so filled with fury, he was like Jocelyn spoke about, like the firecracker, getting ready to explode, thinking it's better back home, forgetting that when he was home, nothing was working for him. And there are people in his household who were courageous enough to say, Naaman, What's wrong with you? Can I ask this morning, how many people do you have in your life who can tell you the truth? Not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. How does Jesus put it? Jesus puts it this way. That the truth will set you free. Naaman was singing the wrong song. And when you're singing the wrong song from the wrong hymn book or from the wrong screen, you need to be able to change your song. He was singing the song of confinement. He was singing the song of captivity. He was singing the song based upon his present circumstances. And he needed someone to tell him, Naaman, it's time to sing a new song. I want to suggest to somebody as I'm reflecting on my week with these tremendously bright people in Oxford and, and, and being exposed to different things, I heard God saying to me, it's time for you to sing a new song. Because, let me say to somebody that a lot of us wrestle with what's God's plan for my life. God's plan for my life and your life is revealed in his word. He's ordered it. But a lot of times we penalize God's plan because we are looking on yesterday rather than letting 
God unfold the future. Today I say to you, I'm not a captive of my past. I'm not a captive of my present. I want God to give me a new Anybody else wants a new song? A new song. When Naaman agreed because his no-name servants said to him, it's time to sing a new song, where did God put him? Not into the clean waters of the rivers in Aram. God put him into the muddy mess of something called the Jordan River. God put him in a place where he would not have wanted to be. But that was the path to his future being fulfilled. Elisha simply says, Go wash in the Jordan and you will be clean. When you wash, possibility will happen for you. When you submit to God's will and God's plan, God will open new doors. When you do as the prophet says, the prophet called Nike, just do it. And when you do it, God opens a new direction. One of the things that Christians celebrate is that God can take anything and any of us and change us and rescue us and deliver us and renew us because we are in the hands of God. And so I'm lifting up today that if something has blemished your greatness, your image of who you want to be, don't hold on to the butt. Instead, hold on to the living God. Because if I get in another space and you get in another space, there's no telling what God can do. In the National Museum of Art in Paris, there's a famous painting called Checkmate. It is the story a chess game hanging on the wall. On, in the middle of the board of the painting is a chess board. Maybe we have some chess players here. There would be castles. There would be kings. There would be a queen. There would be knights. There would be a bishop. What else would there be? Rooks or pawns. In this picture, there is a boy who is 16 years old. He is on one side of the table with a big tear running down his face. His head is down. And on the other side, there is devil, Satan, the liar, the one who is pointing at him. And saying to the boy, the game is over. Well, a famous chess player came into the museum one day. He looked on the painting. And after the first hour was there, he was still looking. He looked on it a second hour. He looked on it for a third hour, and the security guard in the museum said, Sir, is something?
something wrong. The famous chess player looked at the painting, feeling sorrow in his heart for the boy. He did not like how the devil was looking on the boy. And when he studied the board, he shouted at the top of his voice, Son, I found a move. You have one more move. I'm here today to say to somebody who might feel like your life is like a chess game and it might feel as if the devil has got you in. You are struggling with tests. You are struggling with temptations and tribulations and all that it feels like is that you should cry and bow your head. God says, I have one more move. The road may be tough. Your journey may be hard. The night may feel like a place of darkness, but God has one more move. Amen discovered that in the midst of his travail and his sadness that God has one more move. Can I say to somebody, if you got up this morning and you made your way to church on this bright and nice day, it means that you have affirmed that God has one more move. And I'm not saying that your journey will not have all problems. But I'm saying to you in the name of Jesus Christ, God has one more move. Well, the devil is always showing up on the journey. He is not comfortable with God's people trying to pursue God's cause and God's will. He will work against you. He will struggle against you. He will try to demolish and Make your life journey. But I'm saying in the name of Jesus. God. Still. Has one more move. If you don't like it that way. There's a hymn we sung earlier. Great is thy faithfulness. Written by a man called Thomas Chisholm. Thomas Chisholm had a journey which was filled with failures and disappointment. He was born in a little log cabin in Kentucky. When he was 27, he entered the ministry. When he was 36, he entered the ministry. But after one year, he had to drop out. Most of his life was spent doing jobs which frustrated him. He never made a lot of money. But towards the end of his life, he wrote this song, which has been a blessing to people all over the world. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou for has been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see all I have needed. Thy hand hath 
provided great, 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 great is thy faithfulness. Let me say to somebody today, God has one more move. If you are willing to move, Naaman took himself and he stepped into the water. First time, nothing. Second time, nothing. In the order of God, if you can center on God's perfect will and plan and purpose, God says when it's right, if you move, I will move. And my God, doesn't anybody here want God to move in your life in a mighty and powerful new way. Let God move. And let him be glorified. Amen.